of all, I want to start with a big smile because <laughs> it's for me such a big privilege staying here. So I wrote down this just because I have to express myself in English, so I don't want to freak out. <laughs> so in case I'm not ready, I will just read it, okay? So, first of all, let me quickly thank the Italian society, the literary society, Francesco Caracciolo, the president of YACT, and all the guys here. So guys, this is a disclaimer, the first disclaimer. So this is not going to be a lesson especially after three, four professors. I'm no one to give you any lessons, okay? So this is a talk that means to me that I will, feel, I will force you to talk to me, okay? So if you are not reading, please get out. <laughs> so, probably you're already tired or you are thinking something like which kind of series do I have to watch? Did I watch Narcos? Did I like it or not? <laughs> stuff, stuff like that. So why, guys, did I pick Elena Ferrante? That's a good question. Why did I pick Elena Ferrante? Because today is a very special day in Naples. It's 19 of September. It's San Gennaro. It's the patron saint of Naples. About, <laughs> about she said, of course. <laughs> about San Gennaro, there is a lot of meat literature about the blood liquefaction. I don't want to speak about religious beliefs, especially here. So, but. What I want to point out is the fact that about San Gennaro, we have probably the two best books about San Gennaro are written by foreign writers. The first one is Norman Lewis, Napoli 44, Naples 44, and the second one is Shandor Marai. Shandor Marai is Sangue di San Gennaro. Shandor Marai was an Hungarian writer and he, he lived in Naples from 1948 to 1952 and he was there to escape the communism and uh, he was there actually to follow Benedetto Croce. Ah, guys, this is the second disclaimer. I will not translate these quotes, okay? So just to, re to reply to your, to your question, not because I'm me, or probably I am, I don't know, but I will explain later why I'm not translating these quotes, okay? I will give you just some meaning regarding these quotes, but I will not literally translate these quotes, okay? Let me read it. A Pasqualino, perché aveva sei anni, e ogni mattina portava giù l'immondizia. Al pescatore Monco, perché ammanziva il mare. A Santo Strato, perché proteggeva. Okay. So, the connection that I did was Naples, literature, Elena Ferrante. Why? First of all, because last year I, was in the, uh, I attended the event of the Italian Institute and I was so surprised by, about the fact that all the, the ladies there, at the moment that they figure out, because there was Anne Goldstein there, do you know who was Anne Goldstein, no? Yeah. You? Being this translator of Yes, as well. she is the editor of the New Yorker and actually she did a great job about the translation and all the, the New Yorker, New York Times push, you know, it's important, the marketing stuff. <coughs> Ferrante Fever, the hashtag on Twitter, uh, and blah, blah, blah. So, the, the funny thing was that when the, these five, six old ladies figuring out that I, I came from Naples, they stopped paying attention to what Anne Boston was saying, and they started asking questions to me, like, is this the real Naples? Is this the real Naples that Elena Ferrante was describing in these novels? Because I'm talking about these novels, the tetralogy about the Napolitan novels. Uh, guys, I think that along with uh, Matilde Serao in Il Ventre di Napoli and uh, let's say probably Il, il Mare non bagna Napoli, we, we discussed it before about this, and Cuzio Malaparte in La Pelle, I think that Elena Ferrante is the one who describes better Naples and this complexity. Because, guys, Naples is not so easy to, to describe. Because I think there are two risks about Naples. The first one is just viewing everything with the eye of prejudice and say like, oh, Naples is the city of Gomorra, it's the city of bad stuff, trash, and all this kind of stuff. The second risk, and for me that I come from Naples, it's even worse, is to justify everything. To justify everything, to start thinking about, no, but Naples is beautiful, this kind of, in Italy we say victimismo. I think it's the same, no, victimismo. Okay, thank you. So, 
the second quote. Matilde Serao il Mente di Napoli. I think that Matilde Serao, and this is the first argument of the night, I think that Matilde Serao in Italy is very <coughs> underrated. First of all, she's the only one that she's the only female character that founded a newspaper in Mattino and she was the first editor. And Matilde Serao il Mente di Napoli wrote. Ascoltate un poco quando un'operaia napoletana nomina i suoi figli. Dice le creature e lo dice con tanta dolcezza malinconica, con tanta materna pietà, con un amore così doloroso che vi par di conoscere tutta, acutamente, la intensità della miseria napoletana. You are not understanding everything, ok? I, I, I don't care. <laughs> so, so, guys, about, about Elena Ferrante, I was smiling before about the theory of who's the actor because I would like to say who cares? <laughs> but I mean who cares about who's behind behind the end who wrote the novels? Because in Italy we spent a lot of time, a lot of investigation, even privacy violation, trying to understand who's that. For me it's an Italia, anyway. But <laughs> just it's a disclosure. But I I, th I think that we didn't point out, let's say, we didn't focus about why Elena Ferrante became an international film. But in Italy we just trying to understand who was her. And I don't know if you know uh, Barbara Alfano. Barbara Alfano is like Natalino Sapegno o De Santis for Dante, it's one of the biggest studios of Elena Ferrante. Um, she used to analyze the Frantumaglia. Frantumaglia is a kind of uh, let's say it's a book, it's not a, it's a book, but it's a um, miscellaneous, um, it's made by miscellaneous work of essays, oh, it's here, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I didn't know, so it's a kind of miscellaneous works about essays, interview in New York Times, and when, it is, when Elena Ferrante um, was wondering again, once again, about, you know, who's the real Elena Ferrante, she used that quote that, to me, is very important. She said, they, um, Jane Austen used to say that writing is already an act of haughtiness, superbia, un atto di superbia. So she wanted, and she still wants, to protect her works. So she wanted to, because in front of my, she used to say, when I, when I was um, young, when I was young and I was trying to read uh, Le Miserable of Victor Hugo, I didn't care about who was him. I just cared about the influence that he could have about me. And we point out in Italy, I saw a lot of, let's say, a lot of uh, articles, even about economical articles, trying to understand the bank transfer that she received. Guys, it's literature, it's not investigation, she didn't kill anyone. So we, we, should, we should be focused about why Elena Ferrante became such an international film. Especially because, and I know that this is not a great thing to say here, Italian culture now, in this moment, is not the best at, at the top. I mean about liter literature production, I mean about the, the, the fame that he has in the world. So, instead of being proud about all the hype, all the success, we used to, um, let's say, use the... Self-deprecation. Self-deprecation. Self-deprecation, but I mean more about, more about a kind of arrogance, because especially in Italy, if we know that something is very well known in the US, we start thinking, ah, in the US, they are not able, they still use pineapple on the pizza. They don't, they don't, they don't understand. They, so they can't, they can't understand the difference between a great job and, you know, a normal, a normal job. But, but guys, I want to point out that the modern literature is everything about American literature. If I have to think about modern age, I mean today, which is the, the writer that you you think about it, it's Foster Wallace, it's Jonathan Franzen, it's Philip Roth, it's Paul Oster. So I think that probably we should be less arrogant 
and trying to see the future instead of watching only the past. Okay? So, okay, go on. Uso la trama, i personaggi come una rete stretta, per tirare dal fondo della mia esperienza tutto quello che vivo e si torce, compreso ciò che io stesso ho allontanato, il più possibile da me, perché mi pareva insopportabile. Non anonimato, ma assenza, perché sentivo il peso di espormi in pubblico. Volevo staccarmi dal racconto compiuto, desideravo che i miei libri si affermassero senza il mio patrocinio. This is the point, guys. She said, I, it's not about anonymity, it's about absence, because I want to protect my works. And I want to protect my works because my works, as a, let's say, um, own life, they don't need, they have to push them to say, I am the writer, I am the one who's doing shopping and writing. Okay, this is the point. Okay, go on. So, Barbara Alfano. Barbara Alfano, uh, I mentioned before, it's like Natalino Sapegno, in, and she started writing about, uh, let's say, the difficulties that she had, because she's living in, uh, in New York now, she had to explain the Napoleon aspects of the novels to the young students, especially in the US. Per me, donna napoletana che vive e lavora negli USA, si è trattato di un continuo esporsi nel traghettarsi da una cultura all'altra, tra passato e presente, e di fungere indegnamente da sfera di cristallo per una classe di giovani studenti, per i quali, ad esempio, risulta difficile capire certi retaggi culturali così ancorati nei personaggi ferrantiani. Domande come perché Delia dell'amore molesto fa sesso con Antonio solo per dare piacere a lui, quando a lei non interessa, ti portano a dover raccontare i come e i perché di una cultura che ha fatto parte della tua vicenda personale. Ti accorgi allora che in Italia di questi retaggi, così come proposti alle opere di Ferrante, non se ne parla tantissimo se non in ambienti specifici. So, about this translation I will ask your help. So, uh, ok, just, just give some... Mila? Yes. <laughs> So as a Neapolitan woman, woman who lives and works in the States, and I uh, had, uh, I was exposed to continuous shifting from one culture to the other between uh, past and present. Um, and I was acting as a crystal ball for a class of uh, young students for which, for example, it is very hard to understand how certain cultural heritage um, is so present in the uh, uh, in Ferrante's character. So questions such as why Delia of L'Amore Modesto uh, has intercourse with Antonio only to give him pleasure, but she's not interested in it. And uh, this type of question brings you to, uh, the, to, to, to explain the, the why and the hows of a certain culture that is part of your personal, uh, uh, personal heritage, your personal uh, history. So you realize that in Italy, of this type of a heritage, uh, as proposed by Ferrante's work, we don't really talk about, if not in specific uh, milieus. Thank you. <laughs> yes? Did you understand that? Okay. Go on. This is the second part, the part I was mentioning before. L'Italia della critica letteraria, che appare sulle pagine culturali dei grandi quotidiani, si accorta poco dello spessore dell'opera di Elena Ferrante, dedicando molto spazio alla sua assenza e commentando solo a margine il valore della sua scrittura lasciando all'autrice il compito di mettere in relazione i due aspetti nelle varie interviste che ha concesso. E poiché alcuni critici italiani non si fidano molto degli americani quando si tratta di giudizi artistici, non ha aiutato il successo d'Oltroceno, che ci ha restituito la fecante di riflesso amplificata. Please. <laughs> so, in uh, the Italian literary critics have not really dealt with um, that they haven't really realized the, the, the importance or the profundity of Elena Ferrante's work. And they have dedicated much space to her absence, and they have only commented um, um, sketchingly about the value of her writing. And they left to the author uh, the, the task to connect the two aspects in the various interviews that she has, um, uh, she has uh, uh, given. And, so some, uh, and since some Italian critics don't really trust the judgment of the Americans very much <laughs> when it comes to art, uh, then uh, the uh, uh, American success of Ferrante really hasn't helped. 
uh, and because they have the given us, true. yes, so you're just sort of given back a, a Ferrante, an amplified Ferrante, so a Ferrante that has been like pumped up uh, out of portion. So that's that's the point, guys. So about the female aspect. So I want to point out why, in my opinion, Elena Ferrante became such an international film, Ferrante Fever indeed. So for me, it's three key elements, combined elements, made this tetralogy an international film. It's a novel about women. So it's a very old-fashioned way to write a novel, but it's a novel about women, their passion, their struggles, their ambition, and this kind of stuff that these women were the queen, the absolute queen of the plot, it's still revolutionary. Unfortunately, still revolutionary in 2017. So the second aspect is the setting, neighbors. Because, guys, neighbors, as I mentioned before, is so close to us, but so far to us. It's uh, probably one of the most exotic capital in, the, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, we are so proud about our tradition, our food. For instance, I didn't eat. Uh, no, <laughs> a word like me was a kind of sacrilege. No. <laughs> so it's not like, okay, guys. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> like, guys, enjoy. But. <laughs> so the, 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 pro the problem here is, was the fact that it's not so easy to tell Naples and Elena Ferrante. Along, eh, along with the French of friendship history, she made it. She made it in a very good way. And so I was so amused when I started watching the Guardian campaign on New York Times, like in search of Naples Ferrante, and they were trying to figure out which kind of Rione mm -hmm. the, the, the life was set on. And the, the, obviously the third element is Anne Goldstein. I think that we can't underrate the fact that Anne Goldstein did a great job, guys. So it's not only regarding the marketing, it's not only regarding the push that she did, because I tried to, to, to read in, in English, and for me it was difficult, because even if Elena Ferrante didn't use the dialect, because in Naples we used to, to, to talk in, in dialect. Do you know? Are you, are you from? Yeah. Where are you from? She? Yeah, you. Ah, uh, Brazilian. Ah, okay. So you know about Napoleon dialect? See. Si. It's very similar. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so the... She's the only Italian in the audience, no? No, 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 no. I have all the friends here. I have the cameraman. I have the... Even if Elena Ferrante didn't use the dialect, but she used a lot of, let's say, half Napolitan, half Italian expression. And to me, it was very difficult to express, sometimes even in Italian, the meaning. I can give you just one example. We used to say, probably even in the, in the south of Italy, we used to say, andiamo a fare lo struscio. That it's not something related to sex or stuff like that. Andiamo a fare lo struscio means, means let's work to do the struscio. Lo struscio, what, what does it mean? Literally, it means when the place were crowded and you were forced to work on the sidewalk and just doing this kind of sound, okay? So, strusciare. So, that means that with one word, she was trying to express the fact that the place was crowded, that there were a lot of guys and she didn't have even the time to manage all the pot. So, can you understand that sometimes it's very easy to, to be lost in translation, no? So, guys, about the, the, the fact that I didn't uh, translate these quotes, it's not only because I'm mean, and we already say that, but it's because, which is the purpose of the night? The purpose of the night is making you fall in love with Italian language, no? So let's, let, let, let's, I want to say that, to me, I didn't want to, ins to insult the English language, but it was a kind of need studying language, not English language. For you it's completely different, because you are lucky, you are English native speakers, so you still have a choice. And so for me, if you fall in love with Italian language, and you want to run away from here just to try to understand, 
which kind of quotes I was, re <laughs> I was reading. For me, this is a, a good point, because I think that in, uh, for everything in the life, the curiosity, curiosity of, is the fuel of the life. Okay? So, let's go with the, the, the last quote. So, Napoli era la grande metropoli europea, dove con maggior chiarezza la fiducia nelle tecniche, nella scienza, nello sviluppo economico, nella bontà della natura, nella storia che porta necessariamente verso il meglio, nella democrazia si era rivelata con l'arco anticipo del tutto priva di fondamento. Essere nati in questa città, arrivai a scrivere una volta pensando non a me ma al pessimismo di Lila, serve a una sola cosa, sapere da sempre, quasi per istinto, ciò che oggi tra mille distingue come... Tra, tra mille distingue cominciano a sostenere tutti. Il sogno di progresso senza limiti è in realtà un incubo pieno di ferocia e di morte. I need your translation. <laughs> Just for this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> ok, Naples the great European metropolis where uh, with greater clarity the um, trust in uh, technology, in science, in the uh, economic development uh, in the goodness of nature, in history that brings necessarily um, to an improvement in democracy, uh, revealed itself with a large um, uh, anticipo, uh, um, uh, completely uh, devoid of uh, foundation. To be born in this city, uh, I got to write once, thinking not to myself, but uh, about uh, Lila's pessimism, serves only one purpose, knowing um, since time immemorial, nearly by instinct, uh, what today, uh, between um, many distinctions, everyone starts uh, maintaining. The dream of uh, progress, uh, limitless progress, in reality is a nightmare full of uh, violence and death. Thank you. So, guys, probably we are arrogant, as I say, but uh, to me, it's still the best language you can learn. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>